Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Katerina Shrey, along with co-host Dr. Victor Fett and our program producer, Professor Larry Shrey. We host M Ukraine, a weekly discussion panel on Russia's war on Ukraine, with guests from Ukraine, military experts, medical personnel, academics, artists, literary figures, and relief workers. Our panel is recorded and circulated nationally and internationally. Special thanks to Marshall University Libraries and MUIT for making this weekly event possible. If you're joining us live, please feel free to use the chat to post questions for our guests. And a quick greeting to our viewers in Ukraine. The time when Today's guest will be introduced by Dr. Victor Fett. The rest of us, please turn off our cameras and we proceed with the show. Thank you, Katerina. I'm honored today to introduce uh, Mikhail Epstein, a Russian-American literary scholar and essayist who teaches at Emory University Atlanta. He's professor of cultural theory and Russian literature there since 1990. He also worked for a while in the United Kingdom at Durham University, where he founded Center for Humanities Innovation. Uh, his areas of specialization include postmodernism, cultural, literary theory, history of Russian literature, intellectual history, philosophy, religious thought, and uh, lately also uh, artificial intelligence, electronic media. Uh, Dr. Epstein has agreed to talk to us about pressing issue of modern, uh, contemporary, current Russian uh, situation and culture, which of course is in the center of uh, the world crisis today. Uh, and uh, we agreed on interview format. I will try to direct this uh, conversation with a few questions. Um, and uh, everyone is welcome to ask uh, questions after after we are done with this part. Uh, so welcome, uh, Dr. Epstein. And my first question is, for many decades, you are the central figure studying Russian culture. Uh, can you summarize for us briefly for the beginning, what aspects of this culture, this civilization, have led to this current point in history? Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Fiat, for inviting me uh, to talk with your audience. Uh, Russian culture, Russian civilization is uh, rather uh, strange, irregular, uh, branch on the tree of world civilizations. Oswald Spengler, uh, a famous German author uh, of uh, the book on the uh, literally uh, sunset of the West, uh, on the end of Western civilization, uh, described Russia as a pseudomorphose. Uh, that is, uh, is it Working, yeah, uh, because somewhere everything, everything is fine. Ah, okay, uh, because uh, uh, Peter the Great uh, uh, established uh, Russian Empire uh, through the opening uh, Moscow, Russia, Moscovia uh, to the West uh, in the early uh, 18th century. Uh, therefore, making uh, an attempt uh, to uh, make Russia part of uh, the Western civilization, whereas uh, Russia itself, uh, due to its uh, traditions, due to its isolation from the world in the time of uh, Golden Horde, which uh, continued for 240 years uh, from the 13th to the 15th century, and uh, due to the uh, autocracy uh, and uh, isolation of uh, Moscovia uh, during the time of uh, uh, Ivan the Terrible and uh, uh, the following uh, uh, 17th century, all of a sudden Russia found itself part of the Western world. And it uh, felt as if uh, Russia was and was not part of this world. And uh, what we observe uh, in, uh, through uh, the 18th and uh, 19th centuries is that Russia, truly following the uh, legacy of Peter the Great, tried to westernize uh, itself. Uh, 
uh, but at the same time, the moods of uh, bitterness, of uh, mm, uh, resentment, of res resentment uh, towards uh, uh, the West, which uh, was uh, practically no uh, 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 respects uh, advanced technologically, culturally, uh, uh, economically, uh, as compared with Russia. Uh, uh, can explain this double attitude uh, Russia to the West, uh, which uh, expressed itself in the division of uh, major Russian uh, uh, political and ideological forces into two camps, Slavophiles and uh, Westernizers. Uh, Westernizers uh, uh, demanded to continue and to accelerate the uh, reforms of Peter the Great to uh, make uh, Russia even uh, more uh, to assimilate uh, the Western uh, uh, traditions, Western political uh, uh, traditions of uh, democracy, whereas Slavophiles insisted that Russia has to uh, uh, return to pre-Petrian conditions and um, uh, to keep it, uh, uh, the, so to say, orthodox purity, innocence, uh, as opposed to the uh, rotten, uh, bourgeois, individualistic uh, West. And these two uh, trends continued to uh, coexist uh, in uh, uh, the 19th century, uh, and the early 20th centuries until the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, which was uh, a very strange hybrid of these two tendencies. On the one hand, uh, um, Russian communism, Bolshevism came as uh, the realization of uh, 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 Western uh, utopia, Marxist uh, utopia, uh, as uh, uh, the society uh, deemed to become uh, the example of economic and uh, social progress, equality, and so on. On the other hand, of course, uh, this revolution completely isolated uh, uh, Russia from the West as the first socialist state. And uh, uh, this uh, duplicity of uh, Russia standing in uh, the world continued uh, up to the uh, end of the socialist uh, epoch, uh, the late uh, 1980s with the um, collapse of the Soviet Union, the uh, reforms and perestroika of uh, 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 Mikhail Gorbachev. At that time, uh, uh, Russian intelligentsia, uh, Russian progressive uh, part of the society uh, believed that uh, it is uh, the end of uh, Russian alienation from the West, that uh, westernizers uh, finally prevailed, and Russia becomes an organic uh, part of uh, uh, the Western world, which uh, seemed to uh, become uh, more and more feasible with uh, Boris Yeltsin in the 1990s and with the earliest years of Vladimir Putin. Uh, but then it became more and more clear that uh, 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 like uh, in case of uh, Bolshevik Revolution, the seeming uh, growing proximity of uh, Russia to the West uh, uh, led to the opposite uh, uh, result, the process of even more radical alienation and confrontation with the West, what we observe beginning, uh, uh, especially clearly, uh, annexation of, the Crime, of Crimea, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, aggression uh, Russia against uh, Ukraine uh, in uh, uh, February uh, 2022. Uh, so we see how this uh, tendency alternately uh, uh, prevailed in Russian history, and now we see Russia uh, at uh, extremely confrontational stance uh, with the West, uh, more potentially uh, dangerous, uh, because it is aggravated by the uh, nuclear potential of uh, Russia and uh, it's uh, even more, I would say, isolation from the world that in the times of communism, because then uh, Russia still had some uh, rational uh, and international doctrine to unite uh, certain communist socialist forces 
uh, in uh, Western world, in the third world. Uh, now, uh, Russian's purpose is just to expand Russian world. It's uh, the purpose uh, uh, as uh, such, uh, for its own sake. And there are uh, naturally not many uh, people and uh, political uh, forces in the world uh, ready to support uh, Russian as uh, the ultimate goal of uh, this new historical term. I don't hear. Uh, thank you so much for okay. summarizing this uh, so uh, clearly. And um, uh, next uh, series of questions probably needs to clarify for our uh, viewers. What do we mean when, when we say Russian and Russia? Because there is a great confusion between ethnic group, historical uh, uh, country, empire. Uh, we witnessed the demise of the USSR falling apart along so-called republic boundaries, which correspond to historical ethnic lines. And uh, you have written many times about alternative states, some kind of alternative history in which Russia could exist not as an empire, but as a series of um, smaller states, uh, looking back into history of Novgorod and so on, uh, centrifugal forces of today. Uh, could they rip modern state further apart? And do you think it is still possible uh, for a Russian country, for federation, to uh, re-image uh, itself? as uh, not an empire, not an heir of empire? This is a difficult question, and uh, I uh, don't think that uh, in the books of uh, history uh, this uh, final judgment on Russia is already uh, uh, written, registered. We are in the open uh, space of uh, history. Uh, but uh, uh, it was um, 33 years ago in 1990, even before the uh, demise of the Soviet Union, when I uh, wrote such a short uh, essay called On Russia's, in plural, Russia's, uh, where I uh, uh, shared my uh, anticipation uh, that uh, not only the Soviet Union as a uh, union or pseudo-union of uh, 15 republics uh, with uh, Russia as, Russian Federation as uh, uh, the largest and mightiest of them, uh, will uh, um, uh, be split, but uh, ra but this uh, process uh, of uh, division uh, uh, will uh, go further into the disintegration of uh, uh, Russian Federation itself, because uh, such a huge uh, country on uh, European or Eurasian uh, continent cannot enter. Um, uh, comparable uh, uh, relationship and uh, natural uh, interaction with uh, uh, its uh, neighbors. Uh, it uh, always uh, tries either to uh, um, swallow the surrounding countries which, uh, or republics uh, that we observe today uh, or to confront uh, uh, them. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, trajectory is uh, this, uh, trajectory to, uh, as we see in the history of practically all empires, to disintegration of uh, uh, this uh, empire, half empire, semi-empire at this stage, because of course Russia lost a significant part of uh, its uh, territories, which uh, now it uh, tries to rewin uh, uh, through this revanchist uh, uh, military politics, uh, but uh, uh, I believe that uh, there are centers of gravitation, political and even more so economic uh, gravitation, that uh, uh, draw Russia apart uh, to uh, the um, Pacific Ocean, uh, the Far East and Siberia, uh, to uh, Northern Europe and Scandinavia, uh, St. Petersburg, uh, and uh, uh, Novgorod, maybe, and Pskov. Uh, uh, of course, there are uh, Muslim uh, republics on the territory of uh, 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 contemporary Russian Federation. So there are uh, at least uh, three, four, maybe five 
uh, uh, centers of uh, gravitation that, uh, in my view, uh, draw Russian, Russia apart. But, of course, uh, the fate uh, of uh, uh, Russia in this geopolitical uh, uh, sense will uh, depend uh, on the uh, success of uh, one of uh, uh, the sides in the current military confrontation. If Ukraine uh, prevails, if Ukraine will uh, succeed to uh, return its uh, territories, that will definitely signal uh, the disintegration of uh, Russia. Uh, that will uh, go as uh, may go as quickly as um, uh, disintegration of uh, uh, Russian uh, autocracy, Russian Empire in 1917-1918. Uh, 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 just uh, in days count. Uh, if not, uh, the agony of uh, uh, Russian semi-empire will continue for indefinite uh, period. It's difficult to predict. Thank you so much. Uh, we are uh, touching already on the war, on current events, uh, but um, I want to ask you a few questions about uh, things you wrote profoundly on. Um, that is elusive concept of mentality or identity. Uh, Russian mentality, or if you wish, Russian soul, things that we perceive in the West through the writings of intellectuals, writers, philosophers, many, many translated over almost 200 years, uh, how this elusive concept has been formed and changing through all this political um, periods, imperial, Soviet, post-Soviet, um, and uh, what, what are the influences, thinking first of all, about uh, what tradition that you outlined, the, uh, of course, Christian Orthodox tradition for a thousand years, and then a Soviet atheist um, state. Uh, how would one make uh, any sense today out of those layers? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Victor. There were uh, several periods, uh, of course, uh, 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 in historical existence of Russia, uh, Nikolai Berdyaev, uh, great Russian philosopher of the mid 20th century, uh, earlier rather, uh, 20th century, uh, uh, singled out five uh, periods, Kiev and Russia, uh, Hort, uh, the Russia, as uh, you know, for 240 years was under the rule of uh, Tatar Mongol uh, Horte. By, by the way, today uh, uh, Vladimir Putin speaking to the uh, public chamber, this is a non significant entity in the Russian political system, but uh, he said uh, uh, very uh, significant for the first time, I think, uh, mm, uh, pronouncement that uh, the Horde was uh, more favorable uh, for Russian history, this period of Tatar-Mongol yoke, than any interactions with the West. And uh, I think it is for the first time that uh, the Russian leader pronounced this uh, historically um, historical judgment, because since uh, probably uh, Peter the Great, uh, since uh, this uh, moment of westernization of Russia, because uh, the majority, the prevailing majority of Russian historians uh, of the 18th, 19th, 20th century believe that uh, uh, the period of uh, Tatar-Mongol yoke was the period of uh, frightening uh, uh, backwardness of uh, Russia that uh, stopped it, uh, its development, uh, economic, uh, spiritual, uh, cultural political for uh, more than 200 years. Now, for the first time, Russian leader uh, in, I would say, uh, uh, accordance with uh, some of uh, extreme Eurasianist uh, nationalist uh, thinkers uh, of the 20th century, they are called Eurasianists, proclaims that uh, uh, the Horde is better than the West. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I would say, 
uh, how to say, summarizes uh, uh, in the best possible way this uh, political twist, political turn that Russia is experiencing in the last uh, 10, 15 years uh, under the rule of uh, Putin. Uh, forward to the horde. Uh, this is how it can be now formulated, again, by today's speech of Putin, in, in the words of uh, uh, Putin uh, addressed today uh, to the public chamber. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, uh, there was, uh, after that, the period of Moscow, Russia, uh, the Petrin Russia, uh, from Peter the Great to the last Russian, uh, Tsar Nicholas uh, II, uh, then the period of Soviet Russia, then post-Soviet Russia, when uh, uh, Russia, post-Soviet Russia, Russian Federation seemed, uh, as I mentioned, to accommodate itself uh, to uh, the existing uh, world, to Western civilization. Uh, and now uh, the decisive split uh, from here. But through all this period, I return to your question. Uh, despite all these uh, hesitations, we can... Uh, uh, mm, we can uh, <clears throat> trace one dominant trend, and uh, this is, on the one hand, uh, overall dependence on the West, uh, on its economy, on its uh, uh, technological uh, invention and uh, scientific uh, discoveries, uh, on its uh, uh, political and philosophical thought, and in the proportion to this dependence on the West, hatred for the West, you can imagine easily this psychological twist. The more I am dependent on uh, somebody, the more I hate uh, the one on whom I am dependent. And this is uh, uh, the complex of uh, psychologically double complex of uh, Russia's uh, attitude to the West, which uh, great Russian poet Alexander Bloch uh, beautifully, uh, though frighteningly, expressed uh, in his uh, poem uh, um, Skiths. Skiths is the uh, name of uh, ancient tribes that uh, lived on the territory of uh, Crimea. Uh, and uh, he said that uh, um, we love uh, Russia with uh, the love of uh, hatred. Uh, uh, there is such a, uh, I will say it in Russian, забыли в мире, забыли вы, что в мире есть любовь, которая изжет и губит. The love that burns and uh, kills. This is the love that Russia kept through all the stages of its uh, uh, development, its evolution or devolution uh, in relation uh, uh, to the uh, uh, West. And uh, accordingly, um, uh, whether it was uh, uh, orthodox uh, uh, church dominating uh, uh, Russian medieval culture, or was it uh, atheism uh, in the 20th century, in the Soviet epoch, but both orthodoxy and atheism, despite the seeming uh, contradiction uh, and uh, incompatibility were used by Russian uh, uh, political leader as a form of opposition to the West. Orthodoxy versus Catholicism and Protestantism. Atheism versus uh, religiosity, idealism uh, of uh, the West. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, in this algebraic equation, what stands uh, in the place of uh, Russian spiritual identity? Uh, orthodoxy or atheism, uh, the meaning, algebraic meaning of uh, this uh, uh, formula is the same, opposition to the West, one form of religiosity against another form of religiosity, or denial of all religiosity, atheism against all forms of religiosity. Of course, atheism was never <laughs> atheism uh, as 
uh, it claimed to be it was a form of political religion where Lenin, Stalin and other leaders played the role of uh, idols, of uh, sacred uh, figures and the entire Soviet ideology of course was deeply crypto uh, religious but I'm not discussing it at this point. The function of this ideology, religious or anti-religious, was always the same. To uh, oppose, to challenge uh, the domination of the West. And now this, uh, so to say, uh, subtext, uh, hidden, uh, but very profound, uh, not just idea, but intuition uh, of uh, uh, Russian civilization, it's understanding of its own identity uh, in the last uh, two years uh, came to the surface. It's just pure, without any rational explanation in terms of theology or in terms of Marxist philosophy, no rational explanation. Purest product of hatred to the West. This is what we see uh, in contemporary Russian geopolitics. Thank you very much. Uh, this uh, opens uh, discussion into several new directions, but um, as we keep uh, to the current events, what you just uh, said explains enormous animosity uh, connected to the Ukrainian war. So um, what you describe, you yourself uh, describe in different ways as in last series of essays as Russian entire world which is very potent um, idea, and uh, also you used the word schizofascism, which is a neologism, and uh, would you please explain to us uh, what this circle of um, images or uh, concepts uh, means, why, why we need new terminology, because what you just mentioned is uh, referring to very recent and rapid developments, which mm -hmm. could not be explicitly observed probably even 10 years ago. Yes, exactly. Uh, thank you. These are uh, very pointed and important questions. Just um, earlier this year, I um, published a book uh, uh, in Russian, but it is being, uh, various parts of it being translated into English. It's called uh, uh, Russian anti-world politics uh, on the edge of apocalypse. Here it is, and with Gustav Klimt uh, painting, uh, which is called uh, Death and Life. It was written, it was produced in 1916 uh, during the First World War. Uh, anti-world, uh, of course, uh, is uh, a kind of um, Periodic reversal of uh, the main uh, Russian uh, political slogan of today, Russian world, Ruski Mir, as uh, uh, enjoying the same uh, quintessential, quintessential uh, ideological primacy in contemporary Russia as communism uh, uh, in Soviet Russia or orthodoxy in uh, uh, Russia of uh, uh, the 17th, 18th, 19th century, when uh, Moscow, the capital of Russia, was proclaimed to be uh, the third Rome, and there will be, never be the fourth one. So this is the key ideology, Russian world, Ruski Mir, of uh, um, uh, contemporary uh, Russian uh, state, and uh, my uh, rephrasing of it, Russian and the world, just demonstrates uh, what I think to be not just the emptiness of what is understood by uh, Russian uh, world in uh, uh, Russian ideology of today, but uh, it's uh, the opposite sense, because uh, there are no any, if you look into uh, definitions of Russian world, what is Russian world, except for uh, purely geographical definitions, and they are also very obscure, once uh, Putin uh, uh, asked uh, where are the frontiers, uh, the boundaries of Russia, responded nowhere. Uh, so Russia defines itself now uh, as uh, uh, the largest territory in the world which uh, has no any boundaries, uh, which has dynamic boundaries, which are not, rec no, which are not recognized 
uh, by any uh, international law which are illegitimate. Uh, nobody knows, including uh, uh, Russian government, where are the borders of Russia, because they now are in the middle of uh, some territories uh, that uh, are that belong to uh, Ukraine, and uh, they are, so to say, annexed uh, to uh, Russia, though, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Russia uh, has uh, uh, assimilated only part of these uh, areas, like the Parorska or Khersonska uh, uh, districts. Uh, so, uh, the essence of Russian world, actually, is uh, described not uh, positively, but negatively, so to say, apathetically, if to follow uh, the terminology of um, theology. Uh, we don't know uh, who is uh, God, with, but we know who God is not, a pathetic theology. So, we know that the Russian world is not this, is not that, and it determines itself own, in, only in its relation to what it denies. Uh, to the enemies of uh, uh, Russia, or like Dmitry Medvedev, who the former president of Russia and for many years uh, prime minister of Russia, said already, I think, in 2013, that Russia on the all sides is uh, surrounded by enemies, and uh, Russia defines itself only through enemies. This is the psychological complex of the underground man, uh, uh, who, the hero of Dostoevsky, who is uh, uh, internally extremely dependent on uh, uh, the people who surround him, on his former friends, on uh, uh, his servant, uh, on a prostitute, but at the same time, uh, his dependence, again, is uh, po uh, posited in the form of denial, of, of extreme irritation and confrontation with these very people uh, whom uh, he denies. And in this sense, uh, Vladimir Putin is an underground man. He, he, this is the closest character in Russian literature that uh, approximates uh, Putin's features. Putin doesn't have any positive ideology. His ideology is that of uh, hatred and confrontation. Nothing positive, nothing to build upon just to deny, just to annex, just to uh, uh, conquer, to uh, rob and uh, assimilate uh, what belongs to others. This is the meaning of uh, Russian uh, and the world, and we see that uh, this uh, tradition of uh, uh, social bonds as anti-social bonds is uh, actually, of course, not invention of Putin. It uh, has very long uh, grounding in uh, uh, Russian history. Uh, I call it one of the principal Russian term is uh, theological, ideological subordinate, which is means togetherness, but uh, it extends and actually it is uh, maintained by the spirit of uh, commonality in crime. Subordinate, as I called it, uh, literally cathiveness, that means togetherness in uh, uh, stealth, uh, <laughs> commonality in corruption. And uh, this uh, negative kind of uh, uh, commonality, negative uh, type of sociality, which uh, uh, defines the quality of uh, Russian world as end world. The bonds are negative. It's not based on the law, but on common lawlessness on common violation of the law, where all people uh, uh, are violating uh, law and therefore a spirit of uh, ubiquitous, overwhelming lawlessness. It's very difficult to understand for Westerners because uh, uh, you would say that, well, uh, corruption is violation of the law and uh, it uh, should be exterminated from the society. Uh, but uh, in Russia, actually, the spirit of lawlessness is what makes society, makes it together, and therefore we should be very much surprised that Russia uh, violates currently <laughs> the international law and uh, mm, 
crosses uh, its uh, legitimate borders because this is actually what uh, makes uh, uh, Russians, according to Dostoevsky, according to uh, traditions of uh, Russian uh, mentality, it is a mentality of denial, of violation, uh, of, uh, uh, I would say, of uh, crime which is not posited as a crime but as a measure of human indignity and uh, humility because uh, all of us are sinful so let's be united in our sins and our indignity uh, this is what i invest in the con concept of integral and regarding schizofascism if i have time uh, sure sure uh, mm -hmm. I, I, it, uh, fascism usually in Russian tradition is almost identical mm -hmm. term with Nazism. And yeah. what you have just described, uh, in my opinion, differs from Nazi ideology quite uh, deeply because Nazi ideology had some kind of weird satanic ideal, the race ideal and everything. It was not complete negation of uh, other, um, of the rest of the world uh, in this sense. Uh, so uh, if you can please briefly uh, mm -hmm. comment uh, on the differences. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, what I understand uh, by schizofascism or uh, schizophrenic fascism, I um, offered this term uh, in uh, 2014 uh, at the time of uh, annexation of Crimea because this was uh, uh, the first uh, moment of uh, such a open confrontation of uh, Russia with the world with international law, with Western civilization, if not to count, though I believe it should be counted, uh, the crimes that uh, uh, Russia had uh, committed uh, in its annexation of uh, part of parts of Georgia in 2008 under the presidency of Dmitry Medvedev, by the way. Uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, why it is a schizofascism? Uh, because uh, on the one hand, it's clearly uh, uh, fascism and uh, now with uh, uh, evolution uh, uh, after uh, the open uh, war against Ukraine it is more and more uh, reminds of uh, Nazis because the ideas of uh, great Russian uh, statehood uh, is more and more uh, emphasized uh, in uh, this new uh, uh, self-identification of uh, 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 Russian ideological uh, mainstream. But still, it remains uh, schizophrenic because, uh, as you uh, rightly observed, uh, fascism is a monolithic ideology. It has its own ideals, its own imperatives, uh, uh, its own uh, logic, uh, uh, which can seem rational, though extremely anti-human, but rational. Uh, in Russia, we see uh, this uh, duplicity uh, that I um, referred to before, because on the one hand, uh, it is definitely uh, uh, fascism, uh, the uh, affirmation of uh, the right of uh, Russia to the territories of uh, other uh, sovereign states, uh, its uh, confrontation with the traditions of uh, uh, democracy, its uh, cult of the leader, uh, it's the spirit of, uh, uh, so to say, patriotism and uh, cult of uh, uh, national uh, supremacy, including even some genetical uh, uh, motivations for such supremacy of uh, uh, Russian people, uh, some mystical uh, rubbish. But uh, on the other hand, it is schizophrenic because uh, this uh, fascist uh, determinant of Russian politics doesn't prevent uh, its uh, leaders to uh, use uh, those uh, benefits uh, uh, that uh, possession of uh, Western property uh, accounts in Western banks, uh, yachts, uh, uh, luxury, 
provides uh, them as uh, the way to uh, preserve uh, that wealth they that they um, uh, uh, concentrated uh, through their position of oligarchs. Uh, that means both uh, politically and economically dominant uh, elite in contemporary Russia. So uh, on the surface of it, uh, struggle against uh, the West. Uh, in actuality, their children still uh, are in the best United States and European universities. Uh, their accounts now carefully uh, hidden are still in uh, Switzerland uh, or in Great Britain. Uh, so it is not that they are wholeheartedly uh, uh, this kind of uh, Russian uh, patriots that uh, serve uh, to uh, their country and uh, have nothing to uh, uh, to hide uh, from uh, their people. It is uh, very corrupted, very, um, I would say, uh, um, bit traitor uh, type of uh, uh, mentality. And uh, um, this also is uh, part of uh, uh, Russian uh, mentality that was most deeply described by Dostoevsky, for example, uh, when he talks about uh, Russian romantic, uh, who is at the same time uh, the greatest rascal uh, in the world, and one that prevent him from being other. He may be a patriot <laughs> uh, in the best sense of this world, as he believes, and at the same time to uh, rob Russia and to uh, trade uh, uh, Russian natural uh, wealth uh, for uh, the sake of primitive uh, enrichment. So there is nothing, how to say, there is nothing monolithic uh, in uh, Russian uh, mentality. It is from the very uh, beginning uh, based on the internal split. And uh, if you look at it uh, from the point of view of rationality, we can find just very schizophrenic type of uh, uh, internal split in uh, the politics of uh, Russian elite today. Thank you. Uh, my last question before I uh, want to give uh, a word to some others who might have um, questions. Uh, my uh, final question here is you're describing a criminal and very sick society. Uh, and these things uh, have been not seen by the rest of the world, who, of course, never wants to see bad things until they come to earth. But, um, uh, of course, we all want to know to look into the future. And um, we know that you cannot trust social polls in Russia. Sociology is very strange there. We know there are heroes, thousands of heroes who are in prison now protesting the war and the regime. But in general, one cannot avoid seeing passivity of Russian population. First of all, those uh, close to a million uh, people who fled Russia, uh, compared, of course, to immigration uh, 100 years ago during the revolution. So do you have anything to say about um, possible change? Um, can Russian society reform within this generation? Uh, are we looking at uh, the failed project completely or, or uh, what kind of hope can we have? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, this is a very legitimate question and um, <laughs> immediately after the book Russian and the World, I published another book about the hope. It's called From Bible to the Pandemic, uh, Poisk uh, the search for values in the world of catastrophes, where I uh, tried not uh, specifically on the material of Russia, but uh, uh, looking at uh, the shaken, unstable world of today to think about uh, those values that can be found uh, strengthened uh, rather than um, undermined uh, through the catastrophes, political catastrophes of uh, today. And um, I think that uh, 
for Russia, I don't see any uh, brilliant future. I uh, don't see any uh, hope for spiritual rebirth, rebirth of uh, uh, Russia, even uh, through that kind of uh, repentance that Alexander Solzhenitsyn, national repentance that Sol Alexander Solzhenitsyn described uh, uh, in uh, some of his uh, essays, especially the one uh, titled uh, Repentance and uh, Self-Limitation uh, as Categories of National Life, 1973. At that time, uh, in the late Soviet Union, uh, it was still thinkable, and perestroika and glasnost of the late uh, 1990s showed it, that uh, there was still hope of uh, regeneration of Russia. But now I think that uh, uh, Russian project uh, comes to its uh, logical or illogical uh, end, and uh, we need uh, to think about post-Russian uh, population, post-Russian civilization. Uh, I don't know how it could be called uh, in the textbooks of the future, uh, but uh, along with post, the term post-Soviet, uh, I think the term post-Russian also uh, comes into imminent uh, use uh, in the generation uh, uh, to come. Uh, I think uh, that uh, the transformations, uh, taking into account, of course, uh, the specificity of Russian population, uh, uh, which uh, in the very gravest and uh, cruelest uh, conditions of uh, Russian military crimes against humanity still uh, demonstrates uh, surprising uh, passivity and uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, any moral or political opposition. I mean, the majority of population. I, uh, of course, don't uh, uh, have in mind those uh, heroic and uh, tragic part of the population that had to emigrate uh, uh, one million or maybe even more. But I don't see any uh, seeds for regeneration uh, in the current uh, Russian society. All that was offered, all that was explored already, uh, offered in the period of uh, from the mid-80s, uh, uh, for 35 years, Russia was an open, more or less open society. And uh, uh, enlightenment, uh, translations, uh, books for the first time published in uh, Russia in this period, including the Bible, of course, uh, the sermons, uh, uh, moral teachings, uh, all this turned out to be in vain. All this was discredited by uh, this... Uh, uh, current uh, leadership, and uh, I uh, don't see any, how to say, any uh, uh, any light in the end of this tunnel. It should be different uh, tunnel in a different direction, and at this point, it's difficult to predict uh, which direction it will take. Thank you, thank you so much for this honest evaluation of uh, the world we are now finding ourselves in. Uh, I, um, we have more time, and if you stay uh, with us beyond the hour, I will be happy to give floor to our regular viewers. Dr. Deutsch, uh, please, uh, Leonard Deutsch is our former graduate dean of Marshall University. Please ask your question, Leonard. Um, Putin has spoken about and has written about his vision of a, a greater Russia, that uh, the Ukrainians uh, essentially are Russians and and Zelensky is a rebel and a bad boy and they have to take down the military apparatus in Ukraine. But, um, but nonetheless, he has uh, targeted um, Ukraine, uh, citizens, uh, just normal non-military people, children, women. Uh, how... How is that justified by Putin and in Russia to kill your brothers and sisters? It cannot be justified. And he even doesn't try to justify uh, specifically the death of uh, children, of uh, women. He, uh, whatever Putin says, 
it's not just lie, because a lie is, so to say, deviation from truth uh, in perpendicular di direction, for say. But what he says is opposite to the truth. And this opposition, uh, very frank, open opposition to the truth, is nothing but uh, actually uh, ridiculing the truth. And he does it very purposefully. What he says, uh, today he said that it was Ukraine uh, uh, who attacked uh, uh, Russia. It was uh, Ukraine's aggression against Russia. You understand that uh, this... Uh, is pronounced uh, not for the sake of truth and even not for the sake of lie. It is pronounced for the sake of some satanic laughter. And uh, this is what can we say about <laughs> Putin. I don't want to uh, uh, use some uh, mystical or uh, religious uh, terminology, but uh, what we uh, very often ascribed to uh, the devil, uh, it is the strategy, political and ideological uh, and discursive strategy that uh, uh, Putin follows. He speaks uh, as a, uh, a laugher, uh, as a, um, a person uh, 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 who impersonates uh, this uh, the spirit of not just of relativity, but uh, of uh, uh, extreme, I even don't know how to say it in uh, uh, English, there are uh, uh, Russian words, gloomlenie, trampling, it's gloating, gloating, yes, gloating, trampling upon uh, the truth, uh, dance on the bones of truth, uh, <laughs> that's it. Uh, thank, you, thank, you. thank you. Yefim Somin, our friend from Boston, please, Yefim. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question, a sort of hypothetical alternative history question, maybe. I wonder if you could maybe speculate on that. Um, the understanding is that, uh, you know, when the successor to uh, Yeltsin was chosen, there were several candidates, and for various reasons, uh, Putin was chosen, uh, essentially... The KGB, as it still persisted, was chosen, and that's that's what determined the uh, subsequent history. Do you think, suppose there would have been a different non-KGB candidate with some um, with di different kind of worldview and credentials uh, would have been chosen? Do you think uh, the history of Russia now would have gone in a different direction, and how different it could have been? Again, as I said, it's a hypothetical question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, there was, uh, in my view, great candidate in uh, Yeltsin's surrounding, Boris Yeltsin, uh, Boris Nemtsov, uh, who, uh, if uh, chosen by Yeltsin, could uh, uh, change uh, the following history of Russia in uh, the most uh, positive and uh, dramatically better way. Uh, but he was, as you know, uh, assassinated in 2015 uh, uh, by Putin, of course. Uh, I do think that uh, the personality does play a huge uh, role in history. And uh, the choice of uh, Yeltsin uh, is uh, one of uh, those fatal uh, choices that uh, predetermined eventually uh, what we observe now. Uh, there were probably better uh, opportunities in the history of Russia, but they were missed. Uh, Gorbachev was uh, also not in line with traditions of Russian history, but uh, it was felicitous, uh, positive, uh, uh, though extremely unexpected uh, leader uh, coming uh, uh, from the midst of Politburo, uh, and uh, Putin was uh, another uh, unexpected uh, leader coming from amidst uh, uh, Yeltsin's more or less, uh, more or less democratic uh, environment. Uh, so this was two extremes in opposite directions.
So you think there could have been some difference? I mean, Nimtsov, yeah. of course, was was on the uh, on the opposite end of uh, of the scale. There could have been somebody sort of more centrist, I guess. I, uh, you know, whatever the candidacy would have I been. I think Chernomyrdin could be better. Chernomyrdin could be much better. The prime minister under uh, Yeltsin, uh, but uh, Yeltsin had to. Uh, launch war against Duma, against Russian parliament, and Chernomyrdin was not approved uh, by parliament, so he had no chance to be elected as a president. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Epstein. Um, anyone else, uh, please, of the panel or the guests with your questions and comments? We have been here for an hour, we will be closing soon. But we uh, have time for a few more questions. Please. I may have a question. Uh, thank you very much for your great presentation. And I like your interview for Radio Svoboda uh, recently. That was fascinating. Uh, uh, we discuss now all future of Putin. Some say he is dead, some say no. So, what is the typical Russian scenario uh, to exit? Uh, and what do you think about uh, doubles? Because uh, Japanese are uh, using technology identified at least two doubles for Putin. So, how it is entrenched into Russian tradition? Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, almost all, I think, Russian uh, leaders had uh, doubles. Uh, I think the best exit for Russian uh, history would be uh, its defeat in the war against uh, Ukraine. Uh, the death of Putin, uh, of course, physical death, uh, would be uh, a positive uh, outcome. But shameful in a certain way, because it would signal that uh, there is no uh, political, historical, uh, intellectual forces uh, sufficient to uh, defeat uh, the aggressor, uh, uh, except uh, biological <laughs> forces that work independently of uh, the awful crimes uh, that uh, he committed. Uh, so whatever uh, is or could be uh, the exit, uh, of course, uh, it would be uh, the end of uh, Putin as a leader, as a ruler. Of course, Haag's uh, court uh, would be the better uh, outcome of Putin's politics and Putin's crimes than just his physical death. Thank you. I, I just would like to ask that actually following question. If even, if for instance, if Putin dies, but Putinism may not die in Russia. Then, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and why? Why Putinism is so popular? Well, because he uh, personifies, uh, that's what I try to uh, uh, say, personifies uh, uh, the uh, deep uh, uh, substance, the deep uh, intuition, underground uh, mentality of uh, Russian people uh, that uh, derived uh, uh, maybe from uh, hundreds of years under Tatar-Mongol yoke, uh, from this uh, duplicity uh, that uh, characterized from the very beginning the fate of Moscow, uh, uh, Rus, uh, Moscow state, uh, hypocrisy, uh, lies, uh, these are the traditions actually uh, which could be observed throughout all uh, Russian uh, history. I don't mean personal lies, but uh, the lies of ideology, the, uh, the absence of truth and of law as the foundation of uh, uh, Russian politics, both internal and foreign. Uh, so uh, Putinism, in this sense, is uh, the expression of uh, national spirit or anti-spirit, whatever you prefer. And uh, 
it is the resonance of uh, the leader and uh, the people uh, that uh, gives certain impetus uh, to uh, Russian history, like uh, 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 magician in famous Thomas Mann's novel, uh, uh, Mario and Magician. Magician is the one who, uh, it's 1929 or 1930, uh, Thomas Mann's uh, short story that uh, illustrates the arrival of fascist mentality, Nazis mentality in uh, Germany. Magician keeps the attention of the audience and Thomas Mann remarks, it's not clear, is this the audience that endows the magician with this evil energy, or the magician endows the audience with this uh, evil destructive energy? And uh, the same could be said about uh, Putin and uh, his audience. Uh, they are in symbiotic, or I would say uh, sim psychic seem psychological relationship and uh, this is very unfortunate uh, for the people that they found in Putin such trivial, such uh, um, Philistine, banal uh, expression of that kind of evil and negative energy that uh, was stored uh, for centuries in uh, Russian history. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Epstein. And uh, we will probably conclude uh, at this enormously sad and not inspiring note here. It's hard to live inside history and uh, analyze it at the same time. Uh, history is happening within not just our lifetime, but uh, enormous rate and uh, we thank people like you the experts who share their insights with with us and hopefully with our audience uh, if we have no more comments or questions uh, from the panel i will ask uh, dr katerina shrey to give a couple of words in ukrainian to our viewers in ukraine Ми зберігаємо вас у наших щоденних думках і молитвах. Нехай милосердний Бог тримає вас у своїй опіці. До наступного тижня. Прощаємося. Слава Україні! Glory to Ukraine! Слава Україні! Glory to heroes, glory to Israel, glory to America. Glory to Israel, glory to America.